Hi, this is Bob Fatrakis bringing you the other side of the news, which is uh, we're more in need of than ever. This is WGRN 94.1 on the Pacifica Network. And we'll be right back with a special guest. Death and hatred to mankind. Poisoning their brainwashed minds. Oh, Lord, yeah. Ah, my favorite historian and uh, scholar of African American studies, Marilyn Howard. Welcome back to the other side of the news. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. I hadn't been on for so long. I was thinking maybe you didn't need me anymore. Well, I hear you've been hanging out with a other Rita? DJ, yeah. other talk show host. <laughs> yes, other talk. Yes, I have. We've had a blast too. I told her, you know, if she wants me to come on, I'll come on. So we've had a lot of we've had a lot of fun. So, and uh, you were telling me before the this has been a strange uh, week, particularly in relation to the president. I, yeah, I mean, I I never thought I'd live to see the day that somebody was more corrupt than Richard Nixon. This guy is out, off the chain, <laughs> out of control. And and you know what? He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Nobody who works for him cares. I mean, I I'm just baffled. I'm just baffled. Killer has has drawn you to the point where he's more corrupt than Nixon. Yeah, I mean, don't you think so? <laughs> I mean, I sure think, and you know, and I like Nixon too. He's way more corrupt than Nixon. I mean, really, if we're able to vote, if, uh, vote him out of there, it'll take four years to just get us back to where we were when Obama left. This is, I mean, he has wreaked havoc, not just in the United States, but all over the world. The Brit strategy, or is he just the classic Mussolini, I mean, bull in a China shop? Yeah, I, I think it's some of both. He's a bull in a china shop because he's, 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 he's clumsy and he's not real articulate, although that gets worse every week. Now he sounds like, you know, a babbling 10-month-old baby or something. But it's also, you know, he's got a plan. And whenever he gets stuck, you know, he reaches in his bag of tricks and pulls out one of his tropes. His favorite one is racism. So I think it's probably like about 80% I know what I'm doing and 20% He's confused and he doesn't know what he wants to talk about. I mean, if you see the the uh, the uh, dialogue, if they put the dialogue up at the same time you're talking to him, it's just uh oh uh, uh yeah well this is great uh, uh you know. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's yeah. planned, but also he just uh, he has no idea what he's talking about. And he's fumbling. He's uh, babbling, so to speak. A lot of people I know say that he appears to be repeating himself. He does. He does. And maybe he's like Reagan, who was, by the time he left office, was kind of showing early signs of, of, of Alzheimer's. He was bragging about passing that test. Yes, he did. <laughs> but who couldn't have passed that test? <laughs> wouldn't be, I wouldn't be bragging about it to anybody. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, is, it is utter chaos. And still, with what, five weeks now, there's five weeks left to the election, still the Republicans hang on to him. You might have he, he peeled off one or two or three, but they are hanging on to him for dear life. I mean, these are people with, they're just as corrupt as he is. They have no morals. They don't, I, I would say they have no morals. I would say they don't really care about this country. To them, it's all about power and hanging on to the seat of power. And so that's what they're going to do. Yes, a couple of people have crossed him and said, you know, this is outrageous. And they've got some Republicans who are going to vote for um, Joe Biden. And they've got all these groups. But, you know, it's five weeks before and he's, he's making this a credible race. You know, if you take away the 3% error rate, I mean, Democrats can't just sit back and say, oh, well, we got it because we don't. He's always got something up his sleeve. What, what do you think is going on with him? And what, what, what is your view of this? Well, yeah, you know, I've always thought uh, he has the bluster of Mussolini and he likes to keep people off balance. He's mm -hmm. placated his base, uh, particularly the far right white Christians, mm -hmm. right to life. And uh, also with the federal judges, you know, he essentially is, Got them all from the, the uh, very conservative Federalist Society. Yep. So all of that uh, he's done. Uh, he's done stuff that uh, they only dreamed about, you know, trying to do in Social Security. 
uh, by essentially uh, passing a moratorium on the payroll tax that would put that system in jeopardy within a couple, two to three years. Yeah. So he's been able to do a variety of things uh, that has made his core base. I mean, in rural Ohio, I mean, you got bikers for Trump. Uh, that latent white supremacy, right? That uh, that pressure from the demographics as the society becomes more and more uh, diverse. Uh, you know, you're seeing a well armed and very scared backlash. Yes, yes, very, very much so. Um, this, um, you know, is base. It's probably about. 20% of the, the Republican Party. But as you said, he is unusual in a politician in that he has done the exact same things he said he was going to do. A lot of times politicians say, I want to do this, and they don't get it done. It gets dropped by like Reagan. He was always talking about city on a hill and quoting scriptures. I never went to church. And he was going to get rid of, dismantle what's left of the New Deal coalition or the Great Society, and he didn't get that done. Trump has gotten this stuff done, and it's, it's in part because his colleagues in the party are more interested in hanging on to power than they are about principle or than they are about doing what's right for the country or whatever. You, know, you, can, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. I mean, there are genuine differences between Republicans and Democrats. But, you know, he sort of erased all that. The norms of what we think of as the presidency, they're gone. You know, everybody said, oh, well, same thing they said about Reagan. Oh, when he gets in office, he'll be okay. Or Clarence Thomas. Well, he'll get on the bench and the gravity of that will hit him and he will. No. <laughs> no. He has done exactly what he said he was going to do. Um, and, and that's, I think, is it's what's scary. I'm always at, oh, please, politicians lie to us. <laughs> Tell us something, then you know, don't follow. I wouldn't want it to go back to the way it was. But he's, you know, he said he was going to build a wall and he's doing it. Um, uh, he said that, you know, he's going to cancel the payroll tax at least for a little bit. He's, you know, he's signing these executive orders. Of course, he's doing primarily executive orders, it's not a lot of legislation, but he's still getting it done. Went after the post office? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, the post office, um, um, Clarence says the post, the mail is the lifeblood of any business, especially a small business. You don't get mail, you know, you, you don't get mail, you're not going to be able to do anything. And of course, it's also the uh, lifeblood of people that are getting medications through the mail, many that's why I'm in rural areas. Yes, I am close, I'm close enough. I can walk to the pharmacy. So there's no way that I'm going to have my medications mailed to me. But if you're somebody who relies on that, then and they're fooling around with the mail, you're in trouble. Yeah, particularly in uh, rural areas. Yeah. And you know, people, people forget or never knew the post office is the only federal office or entity mentioned in the Constitution to yeah. post offices and post roads. So that was considered. And now Kevin Costner is a genius. He did that yes. movie, The Postman, that everyone laughed at. You're showing mm -hmm. that once the post, the post office goes down, the whole country falls apart. Exactly, exactly. Or yeah. remember the, post, the postman always rings twice. <laughs> but it's the only office in the Constitution. And, and that came together because the, um, the rebels, you know, amongst the so-called founding fathers, those people, they were writing each other, you know, no, no phones or anything like that. And they kept correspondence going. And so they just made it easier and easier and easier for mail to travel and to get there and, and slash the time. You know, if you look at um, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, he said that when he was over here, America had four times the number of post offices in France and twice the number of post offices in Great Britain. Now, you know, there are lots of things wrong with the Postal Service. It's, it's kind of clunky and it's inefficient and it was, you know, it's running a deficit and a lot and things like that. But I mean, shut that down, there's going to be real chaos. And I wonder, I always have concerned 
uh, when we see things in policy or pu public policy or politics, people don't get concerned until it has a direct effect on us. So do we have to wait? I mean, it's only five weeks to the election. Monday's Labor Day. Um, how long would it take before grandma's not getting her medication through the mail? And how long will it take for all those grandmas to get mad and rise up? So um, in, in some ways, he's sort of like an evil, I'm not going to say evil genius. He's not that smart, but he certainly um, can play people. And he has, you know, he has no morals. He's probably the most amoral president or immoral president we've had since um, Kennedy. <laughs> Way more immoral than that. So yeah, he, he, do, he knows what he's doing. And these books that are all coming out, what do you think? Are you going to read that? Um, you're going to make me review the, uh, that book for uh, Melania's best friend wrote? Well, I think you should uh, tell us which one's the best. Is it? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, 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 only, I only do it. John Bolton? I'll take one for is it, is it his niece? Oh, yeah. Is it his niece? And, and yeah. what about uh, his uh, fixer? Cohen, isn't he yeah. coming out? Yeah, you, um, and here's the thing though. Okay, um, on the one hand, fine, this is com coming out. But again, she has known him all her life. They knew when he was running. You know, she said at one interview that the family kind of took it as a joke because they were so sure that nobody would vote him in the office. So she is not telling us, neither is Bolton. Neither. But when you have a two-party system, yeah, yeah, but still they knew this. And even if they didn't know it and he won, they knew it then. And when the time to come out was then, the time was to come out, the perfect time would have been before the election, you know, during the summer when he's running, he's got the nomination. And if you skip that, then the day after the election when he's, you know he's gonna be in there. And so the, the women's march on, uh, Washington in, in January after the inauguration. That was, those people are late to the party. All these people who've written books about him, who've worked with him, they know him. They knew this. And so they are complicit in allowing this behavior to continue. And of course, uh, now the question of white supremacy from Charlottesville to uh, marches in Ohio and Bethel, Ohio. To uh, Portland, I, Oregon. Yeah, uh, and what do we make of that? Uh, well, you know, first off, it, it, it shows us that what Southern politicians were saying during the modern day freedom movement, 40s, 50s, 60s, is that racism exists in the North and the West, and it's a lot worse than uh, the racism in the South. You know, during the time when uh, Kennedy administration was, was trying to get the two black students in the University of Alabama. Wallace said, look, no Negro in Alabama is ever embarrassed. He knows the cafes he can go to, and he knows the cafes that white people go to, and he doesn't get them mixed up. But, you know, one of the things that a lot of Southern politicians said was, why you're, this is, we're the whipping boy. Why not look at um, Chicago? Chicago was probably the most racist city in the North. <laughs> So I think this well, that, didn't Martin Luther King said he never was more scared than uh, when he, he was in he Cicero. Said that, he said that people from Mississippi had to come to Chicago so they could learn how to hate. So it shows us that this just is not a regional problem. But the other thing, you know, one of the things I've, I've said in class today, I taught classes today, and and you know, this is a long-standing historical thing. You look at Oregon. 2% of the population of Oregon is, is black, but Oregon is also when it was a territory and when it passed its first constitution and became a state, they wrote all these black, anti-black laws. I mean, you literally as a black person could not move into the state of Oregon, you know, in, in, in 1848. So, um, you know, as, as Malcolm allegedly said, the chickens are coming home to roost. So I think it's a combination of those things. We see that this is not a Southern problem. But you know what, already you can see the uh, energy and the attention of white supporters sort of flagging. Okay, we've been doing this for four weeks. I gotta go home now, I got other things to do. <laughs> um, and, and they're the one, it's white people who have to do something about this. It is not people of color. It's, you know, it's white people who invented this. It's white people who prop it up. It's white people who pass it on in perpetuity. 
and already they've got compassion fatigue. So what's going to happen when the vast majority of them say, okay, well, I've done this for a month, got to go home. Well, you're working uh, on a project, as I am, relate to uh, the history of white supremacy in Ohio. Yes. yes. Uh, any thoughts on, uh, on that? How's that coming? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's a difficult book to write about because it's very unusual. But again, what it's doing is sending me back to, you know, the literature from sophomore, junior, uh, senior years in high school that this is a problem that is all over the country and that Ohio does not deserve this exalted place they had, you know, home of the Underground Railroad. There was that uh, uh, Walter Seibert who taught at Ohio State in the early 20th century and he said there were more than 300 stations on the Underground Railroad. Well, if you go to the Ohio Historical Society and get a map, you'll see 12. So where did all those other ones come from? <laughs> So, you know, it, it's, it's showing me, sending me back to the, the literature from my early days as a student, but it's also showing me that Ohio, just like Mississippi or Alabama or anything like that, they're, they're not, not deserving of this uh, reputation and moniker for being so racially open and tolerant. How are those pictures coming along? Well, I, I picked some pictures and sent them in, and I, I, including one I took myself oh, uh, okay. for the project. This is The Other Side of the News, streaming to you from the Indie Media Studios of the Free Press Network on YouTube, but also available online at WGRN.org. Plus, listen to us on Columbus, Ohio's two volunteer-run, low-power FM radio stations, Friday at 5.30 p.m. on 94.1 FM, The Green Renaissance, and rebroadcasted Mondays at 4.30 p.m. on WCRS, the community radio station, both 92.7 and 98.3. Uh, and FM. again, people can listen to this uh, live on uh, Friday at 5.30 at WGRN 94.1 and also pick it up or be streaming live on the WGRN.org website. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of them is, you know, the uh, 14 words about you know, securing the future for white children. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in Newark, Ohio, or mm -hmm. NERC as they say. Uh, there was oh, yeah, a huge no. group of neo-Nazis in, in NERC. Well, uh, the other, another thing that's been happening is that um, I think it's um, Chicago or Pittsburgh or something, but in some neighborhoods, somebody uh, wrote a letter and went around and stuffed them in the mailboxes and stuff um, and said, you know, work to keep our state white. Um, so these, these, you know, all these streams are, are coming together. And it really, it reminds me of 1968. Now I was young then, but I had two older sisters, one who's five years older, one who's eight years older. So, you know, I remember three boys from my neighborhood who came back from Vietnam in coffins. I remember the riots, I remember that. This very much looks like 1968 to me, and it, but even scarier, even scarier. Well, because uh, in many ways, Trump's combination of Wallace and Nixon Mm -hmm. Ideas, uh, and who knows uh, uh, who else? I, I, I think Mussolini, and from the gestures, it's got that kind of blustering national, you know, authoritarian uh, personality. Yeah, he does. He likes that. He, he likes that. He likes that being in charge. He likes having power. He likes being able to kind of push people around or think he is. But, um, you know, like Sunday, I think it was, um, after the end of the convention, he sent 90 tweets in. I don't know, a couple hours? <laughs> Government by tweet? <laughs> well, wh what did you make of the convention? I mean, every time I turned it on, he was talking, uh, which I, reminds I me yeah, of, uh, of dictators and, and authoritarians. It's like, uh, and occasionally, you know, we, we'd throw people out of the movement for that kind of stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but he, Hi, uh, well, Trump will be speaking tonight and tomorrow he'll be introducing and speaking the keynote speaker. And then he'll be following the keynote speaker on uh, uh, Thursday. And I loved it that his children were on there, you know. I don't think I've ever heard that one daughter even open her mouth. Well, you know, he's fond of Kim Jong-un. Yeah. <laughs> You want to go with the dynastic quality of authoritarianism, in yeah. that case, uh, the Kim you know, family, Marxism, has, Leninism. Right. He's mentioned that before, too. He thinks Ivanka would be a great president. 
you know, so they, maybe they're just biding their time or something. But this, I mean, this is corruption. It is so corrupt. And it would be, you know what it reminds me of? Um, I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious or, or take away from the, the seriousness of what's going on. But there's a Looney Tunes cartoon with um, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and Elmer Fudd. And Elmer Fudd wants a duck dinner. And Daffy is trying to talk him into having a rabbit dinner. And oh, yeah. so the catchphrase in there is going back and forth. He does not have to shoot you now. He can shoot me now, that kind of thing. And that's kind of what this looks like. It's just utter chaos. And I was reminded of that today. And again, you know, if the consequences weren't so serious, another black man killed yesterday in custody. Um, you know, if, if the consequences weren't so serious, this would, um, this, we'd be laughing at it. We'd think it was a cartoon. We would be laughing at it. And, and you know what else? If we go back to these killings of uh, unarmed uh, black men, uh, regardless of whether they're doing something or not, you know, this goes back to uh, police training or the lack of police training. Uh, it's back to the um, time of slave catchers. Don't have, they don't have to catch a slave, just catch a black person because that's the natural uh, thing for black people. They're all enslaved. So if you can't find the one you went after, just take any black person. You know, and, and, and this is like this. And, and everybody thought, okay, cameras, all we gotta do is get cameras. Well, one of the reasons why white people just took to the streets was because they saw what everybody else said. That's all, eight minutes of some police officer with his knee on somebody's larynx. And even the worst white people had to admit, oh gosh, that's not really a nice thing. So having cameras, that hasn't done it. Uh, being nice or making nice, that hasn't done it. You know, these are things that are, are fundamentally need to be changed. Um, and we won't get that kind of change with the current government that we have now. I mean, you've got the Attorney General of the United States, the, the chief law enforcement officer in the country saying, no, I don't think there's a dual justice system, one for whites and one for blacks. And he's saying it with a straight face. So this, this is dangerous. This is really dangerous. And of course, uh, Trump seems to want to fan the flames wherever there is a police shooting. It's followed by protest and any violence, right? He, <coughs> well, he wants to be there to fan the flames and, uh, and the bring mayor in of, the feds. Yes. The mayor of Kenosha and the guy, they said, don't come, don't, <laughs> don't come by. And you know what? That's what happened three weeks ago. Black leaders were saying to him, don't come to John Lewis's funeral. You are not going to ruin this for us. Just stay away. <laughs> uh, and so he begrudgingly came out with, oh, he died. We're going to lower the flags and stuff. But don't go because he just makes things worse. And all he could say was, well, I don't know what John Lewis did. He didn't even come to my inauguration. Well, he didn't go to Bush's either, but you don't see Bush crying about it. <laughs> so but, uh, we do have the oddity, though, of... Uh... George W. Bush not supporting Trump, uh, and of course, uh, McCain's uh, mm -hmm. widow not yeah. supporting Trump, and George Mitt Romney yeah. not supporting <laughs> Trump. So the, the last three nominees of the Republican Party for, uh, for president, none of them are voting for the man. Yeah, no, no, none of them are. You know, his own, you know, he, somebody you'd think he'd have a natural affinity for him, a fellow Republican, many of them are saying, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. You know, we can't do that. We're not going to do that. So I, I tell you, Bob, this is like, you know, hell's a popping all over place. <laughs> Topsy turvy, the world turned upside down. And I think it's a little bit frightening. I mean, as a black uh, person, black woman, I, some days I'm feeling kind of traumatized and, and, and under siege. I don't know if you saw the clip of the uh, white man who went into a Walmart somewhere and they've got these signs that say you have to have a mask on. And he threw a conniption fit. He was in this black woman's face. If he had been any closer, he could have been kissing her. He was screaming and yelling at the top of his lungs. So there are two black female clerks standing there, two white clerks standing there, guys. You think either of those guys went back to get the manager or said anything? And all his attention was 
uh, directed at this black woman who face he was so close to he could have kissed her. Okay. Or contaminated her or gave yeah, her a exactly, virus. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's my, you're, you know, tramping on my constitutional rights. I don't want a mayor, man. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's outrageous. And, and this is this, we've, that, it's because we've had a leader for four years who has not led. Uh, he's only led to destroy or uh, confuse or, or whatever. We, you know, he has, he has turned all the, the norms of the presidency upside down. I mean, think of Washington. He served two years and he went home. That's the precedent. You know, he served two years and you get this guy has thrown out the, the norms and, and rules and stuff to the presidency. It's, it's gone as far as he's concerned. He doesn't care. So frankly, I was rather surprised that they wanted to live in the Are market. you concerned at all that he might not leave even if it... That he might not leave? Uh, he might not leave. That uh, oh, he might claim oh, that I'm, they I stole the election. Concerned. I I think that's his that I, I think that's the the issue here. Um, it certainly would help if if uh, Biden you know blows him out by twenty or thirty percent. But if it's anything less than ten percent, I I think we're going to have. Well, to Biden him. could win by fifteen points, and uh, it could be close. Yes, because of the elect electoral college. Yeah, electoral yeah. college. Yeah, which but I understand is an old racist institute. Yes. Well, it gave more power to the states, particularly exactly. the southern slave states. Exactly. It is, it is an anti-democratic institute, and it worked in 2016 exactly the way the framers set it up to work, and that is to smother democracy. So I am very concerned that he will not leave. I, I think that's what he's counting on. I dare, I dare you. I de-double dare you to make me leave the White House. I'm surprised they were willing to move in because it can't be nearly as grand as they like. For them, it's probably like sleeping at the motel. Well, in a lot of, uh, well, uh, a lot of people in rural areas are claiming the post office is going to steal votes away yes. from Trump. Yes. So there's already a narrative uh, developing. There is. But we got a minute left. Any uh, last thoughts for the listeners on the other side of the news? Well, you know, as my late mother used to say, and you know, knew my late mother. I did indeed. The woman was, and had she been Catholic like yourself, she would have been she, a saint. She would have been a saint, yeah. A, 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 a saint like her, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled woman. She, I always think of the phrase she has when you had all this crazy. Prayerful. Yeah, <laughs> craziness going on. She said the devil was working overtime because he know he ain't got long, and it kind of looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> Satan is busy. <laughs> Satan is definitely very busy. <laughs> I mean, uh, my take is on a daily basis, he does stuff that other people would have been forced out of all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every office for impeach. I mean, he's just yeah. telling people, in North, his supporters in North Carolina, to vote twice for him. Yeah, vote well, twice. <laughs> I thought that was only Who for Chicago. <laughs> I know. It's only Chicago. Voter, Even if you're right thinking off. that, you don't go public and uh, say that, right? I mean, the stuff he, you know, I he mean, Charlottesville, been. I mean, neo Nazis attack and kill somebody yeah. and have a Third Reich, uh, you know, v parade. And what in the hell do you, do you do? You say there's good people on both good sides. People on both sides. Thanks, Dr. Marilyn Howard, for being on the other side of the news. Thanks. I always enjoy it. And I, I hope you'll have me back. And all uh, right. Then hatred to mankind, poisoning their brainwashed minds. Oh!